Tonight we're going to begin a very important series, an incredible series, taught by Pastor Robert Morris. Perhaps many of us, we have been here, been around for several years, and so we've seen this teaching before. It is incredible teaching, it is powerful, it is biblical, it is scriptural, and it is helpful when applied to our lives. A few things I want to mention at the onset of this series. Number one, I want our young people to be in here because these are important principles that if you catch early in your lives, our youth, our hyphen, many of you are starting to work, and if you will catch hold of these principles in your life and apply them, you will see God throughout your lifetime bless you in ways unimaginable. Let me be clear, and I, 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 I'm sure I don't have to say this, but I want to state it anyway for the sake of there being any confusion or any undertone of anything else. I teach this and I believe it is so important for us to catch hold of this type of teaching because I truly believe that the word of God is infallible and has the power to allow us to live life beyond where many of us wind up living our lives. I have a tremendous burden to see us as the people of God live in the realm of financial freedom, not just physical healing, emotional freedom, mental, spiritual, all that inclusive finances and being financially free is something that will liberate our lives, our families, our marriages, and literally change the landscape of how you live life. Knowing that you live under the protection of God's blessings, his covering, and the covering of your word. And he is a God who is true to his promises. We are not teaching this. We are not teaching this because we are in need or because there is a desperate situation or because we are trying to take advantage of anyone. Everything that you will hear, everything that will be taught comes out of the word of God. And we stand here tonight as testaments that if you will apply God's word and trust the Lord and obey his principles, that God will bless you in ways unimaginable and not just limited to the realm of finances. He is a faithful God. You say, well, pastor, well, certainly we know this. We're Christians. We come to church. You do the offering every Sunday and every Wednesday, and you've been doing this for years. I understand that. However, I also understand, and this is important for some of us that have been around, is that not everyone is applying these principles in their lives. There are some of us that have forgotten. There are some of us that don't believe it yet. There are others that have never heard the teaching and never been introduced to it. And my goal is to make sure that you are set up, that you are edified, that you are equipped for the most successful and blessed life according to the word of God that is available to you. I would teach you on faith. I would teach you on the gifts of the spirit. I will teach you on the word of God, the power of prayer. It is a part of the balanced diet. And no matter how much our flesh may resist it, we cannot separate our life in Christ from the goods and the material blessings and the financial blessings that are bestowed upon our lives. You cannot separate the two. And it is very powerful and very important that we at least are taught and left with the opportunity because that's all it is. Everyone has the opportunity to do or not do what the Word of God teaches and therefore to live in the results and the rewards thereof. And so it is in that spirit that over the next four weeks, we are going to cover some weeks I'll ad-lib, some weeks I'll add some, some weeks I'll talk, some weeks I'll share some things. But we're going to do two lessons tonight. And over these next four weeks, we're going to cover all six lessons. They have already been uh, merged and, and they have been uh, put together in a way that one will go into the other. And so sit back, relax, open up your ears, take notes, open up your hearts, and let's listen to the teaching of the word of God. And ushers, if we can, maybe we can close the big house lights and just leave the tracks on for now. All right, we're beginning a new series called The Blessed Life. And I want you to understand that this is my life message because it's, it's been in my heart for years. It's been something Debbie and I have been living and I've been preaching and teaching for years. The Blessed Life now, the book, um, uh, millions of copies, uh, I've been told 30-something languages around the world. I've given all the royalties away to this book. 
And so um, it's been, it's, it's just God uses it all over the world. Here's the reason, because there's truth in this book that will change your life. I promise you. And it'll change your marriage. And it'll change your family. And it'll change your health. And it'll change your relationships. And it'll change your job. It'll change your life. It's a blessed life, not a blessed pocketbook or a blessed wallet. It's a blessed life. And so um, I want you to turn, if you can, really to two passages this time. Matthew 7 and Luke 6. Here's the reason, because I'm, we're going to read a passage in Matthew 7, and then we're going to flip to Luke 6 quickly so we can read the parallel passage. So look here at Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. It says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, I just want to ask you a simple question. Uh, is the word money anywhere in those two verses? No. And, and the context is judging. Don't judge or you'll be judged. Okay? Now, I want us to commit to short-term memory the first phrase and the last phrase. And I'd like you to just say it after me. Judge not and you will not be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Say that. Now flip over to Luke 6, okay? Now let's say them one more time. Judge not, and you will not be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Okay, look at the first sentence of verse 37, Luke 6, 37. Judge not, and you will not be judged. No, you don't have to say it. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, though. Okay. Uh, and then look at the last sentence of verse 38. For with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Okay, I want you to understand this is the parallel passage, but I want to show you a verse in the middle that, in my opinion, many times the context is not understood. Okay, so Luke 6, 37 and 38. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Now look at verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put in your bosom. For, with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, let me just make a statement, and this might shock you. The word money does not appear in those verses. And yet most of the time when we hear Luke 6, 38, we think about money. As a matter of fact, when we think about the word give, we think money. I was being interviewed by a magazine a while back, and they, they said, how often do you preach on giving? And I said, every week. <laughs> they said, you preach on giving every week? And I said, yes. I think what you meant to ask me was how often do I preach on giving money? And that's about every three years. Every three years, I do a series on stewardship and generosity. But you didn't ask me how often to preach on giving money. You asked me how often to preach on giving. I can't preach on grace and not talk about giving because God still loved the world. He. I can't preach on marriage and not preach on giving because a marriage will not work if you're not givers if both people aren't givers. And again, not finances, not giving. Get, you understand what I'm saying? This, this applies to every area of our life. That's what we have to understand. Giving is about the heart. Here's the title of the message. I should have given it to you earlier, but the title is, It's All About the Heart. It's all about the heart. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Some people say, well, you know, they're after my money. Let me explain something to you. Yes, God is after your, not the church. God is after your money because he's after your heart. And your heart is connected to your wallet. Your heart follows your treasure. You put your treasure in a stock, you put some money in a stock, you'll start going on the internet checking to see how that stock's doing. And you never checked it before. And you never cared about it before. But you care about it now because your treasure's there. You want your heart in the kingdom? You put your treasure in the kingdom. Okay, so it's a hard issue because he's talking in these verses about judgment, condemnation, and forgiveness. Don't judge or you'll be judged. 
Don't condemn or you'll be condemned. Don't, and, and then he says, forgive and you'll be forgiven. And then he says, give. Okay, what's he saying though? Give judgment and judgment will be given back to you. And here's the part I don't hear a lot of preaching on. Good measure, press down, shaking the other and running over will men give judgment back to you. For with the same measure you give judgment, you'll get judgment back. That's the context of these verses. Judgment, condemnation, and forgiveness. Now, you can apply it to other areas because of the laws of sowing and reaping. If you give a seed, you don't just get back one seed. You get back a, a tree or a plant with many seeds. And that's the way God is. So whatever you give, you're going to get more back. So it would be better to give good things <laughs> than bad things because you're going to get more of it back, whatever it is. I was counseling with a lady one time, and she was a single mother, and she didn't have anywhere to leave her kids. And so she brought her kids, and we just let them. I said, please come anyway. And she just left them with the, the, uh, my assistant. We left the door open there, and uh, I was talking to her. And here's literally this is what she said. She said, my, my kids yell at me. She said, they yell at me. I, I don't know why. They, and then she did this. Y'all stop talking out there. <laughs> I don't know why they yell at me. I said, Luke 6, 38, give yelling and yelling will be given back to you. <laughs> Good measure, Preston. Okay, all right. How, how are you going to develop a heart of generosity? Well, way back Deuteronomy 15, God tells us what we need to do, four things we need to do because it's all about the heart, all right? So Deuteronomy 15, look at verses 7 and 8. If there is among you a poor man of your brethren within any of the gates in your land which the Lord your God is giving you. Notice God's giving you the land, by the way. Notice the word giving. You shall not harden your heart. It's about your heart. Nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly, that would be about your heart, lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. Okay, so there are four things that we need to do if we're going to become generous givers. Here's number one. Deal with a selfish heart. Deal with a selfish heart. Look at verse 9, Deuteronomy 15, verse 9. Beware lest there be a wicked thought in your heart. Notice heart again. Saying the seventh year of the year releases a hand and your eye be evil against your poor brother and you give him nothing. And he cry out to the Lord against you and it become sin among you. Notice selfishness. It's wickedness in God's eyes, and it becomes sin. Now, here's what he's saying. He's saying, um, now, when your brother comes and asks to, to borrow from you, uh, you, you, you open your hand and willingly lend to him. You, you, you open your heart to him. But don't let there be this wicked or selfish thought in you that says, man, this is the, the year of Jubilee. That means all debts will be canceled. In other words, if he came and said, hey, I need to borrow some money. My crops were bad this year. And, and you thought, you know what? Six more months is the year of Jubilee. If he can't pay me back in six months, then, then uh, I have to cancel this debt. See, God implemented an economic system where all debts were canceled every seven years. So if you thought, you know, I'm not going to do this because he might not be able to pay me back. You know what God said? Don't do that. Don't think that way. And here's what he called it. He calls selfishness wickedness. He's dealing, he's telling the people of Israel, this, I don't want you to do this. I want you to be generous like I'm generous. Yeah, let me ask you a question. Why did God create giving? You ever thought about that? Because God did. It's, it's, it's all through God's Word. So why did God invent or create giving? Do you really think that God needs your money to support His work? I mean, is the light bill, you know, in heaven, uh, you know, too big for God? They running out of gold for the streets. I mean, cattle on a thousand hill, he's running out of cow. I mean, you know what? God needs you. No, listen, God did not create giving for his sake. He created giving for your sake. Giving more than any other activity that a believer does work selfishness and greed out of our lives. This is why I don't like much of the preaching I hear on giving 
because it's give to get. Give and you'll get, give and you'll get. And let me tell you what that does. It actually works selfishness and greed back in your life. And what do you, how do you think God feels? When, when, when a preacher preaches, give and you'll get, give and you'll get, and people say, well, I want to get. So I'm going to give. I wonder if God is thinking, well, this is great. All of my people are catching the revelation of getting. No, we need to catch the revelation of giving. Now, I do want to say, ladies, that there's an area of selfishness that men never grow out of. I just want you to know, okay? We do not want to share our food. <laughs> and for some reason, you want our food. And I don't, I don't understand it. And we do not want to share our food. The very first time, Pastor Tom and Jan Lane sitting on the front row, Jan said, I knew you were going to say this, sitting right there. The very first time I went to dinner with them, I, we were going around the table ordering. I ordered, and Jan said, oh, good. I've been wanting to try that. <laughs> I, I never even met the woman, and she wanted to eat off my plate. And I said, well, you better order some because that's the only way you're going to get any. <laughs> Think about it. Come on. What does every woman say when you're at the drive-thru? What does every woman say? You say, well, would you like something? No, I'll just have some of yours. <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> I'll buy you two orders of fries. But you're not getting any of my fries. And the fries that fall in the bottom of the bag are mine too. So point number one is deal with a selfish heart. I don't know if that's directed just to the men or to all of us, all right? Here's number two, deal with a grieving heart. Grieving heart. Now he's talking about money, he's talking about giving. Verse 10, you shall surely give to him, give to him, and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him because for this thing, watch, for this thing, giving with the right heart, the Lord your God will bless you in all your works. That's amazing. And in all to which you put your hand. If you learn to give from the heart with the right heart, God will bless you in everything you do. That's what he just said. See, we, under, we need to understand this is a heart issue, but selfishness attacks us before we give and grief attacks us after we give. You ever given uh, a large amount or made a commitment and then something breaks and the enemy comes immediately and says, see, you shouldn't have done that. He comes in and then, and grief because we, we gave. Now, you know, I'm sitting here, here I am preaching this message and I had this thought just go through my mind. And after 30 years of preaching, I ought to know to just let the thought go on by. But here's the thought I had. I just thought to myself, I, I'm going out to eat after the service and, and I, don't, I don't have any cash. I just had that thought just go through my mind. You know, I'm just, oh, wow. Wow, look, a hundred dollars. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start saying those thoughts more often. Um, Okay, no, let's, let's talk about that for a minute, all right? Why, when I said, I, I don't have any cash, why did David get up that fast and give it to me? Let me tell you why. Because I gave it to him before the service. <laughs> it's my $100. Okay, now, he's not grieving that he gave, because, why? Because it was mine. See, see, the reason that we grieve after we give is because we thought it was ours. And the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So when we give back to God what is already his, then we don't grieve over it. So deal with a grieving heart. Here's number three. Develop a generous heart. Develop a generous heart. Look at verse 14. You shall supply him liberally, generously from your flock. 
Watch from your threshing floor and from your wine press. Now watch this. From what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give to him. God wants us to be generous. We were born selfish. We are born again generous. We just have to renew our minds. You think about it. You really want to be generous, even hoping not to receive anything in return. What he's doing is dealing with the heart. It's the, it's the first thing we have to try to teach our children. I want you to think about that. What do you have to try to teach your children that is so hard to teach your children? Share. Share. No, we share. And what happens? A little neighbor boy comes over to play, and the neighbor boy picks up a toy. What does your boy do? Drops the toy he's playing with, runs over and says, I was playing with that. I was playing with that. Right? And the neighbor boy says, okay. So he goes over and picks up something else. That your boy runs over. I was playing with that too. I was playing with that too. Do you realize what God is saying to all of his children? When are you going to grow up? When are you going to grow up? When are you going to become like your father that's so loved that he gave? You know, I heard a story of my uh, son Josh and daughter-in-law Hannah told me a while back. They have two children, Grady, who's seven, and Willow, who's four. And they got in the car. Hannah picked them up from church. And Willow said, Mommy, did you know that there was a woman in the Bible that only had two pennies, and she gave both of them to God. And Hannah said, yeah, that's, that's a wonderful story. And Willow said, I want to give something to God. So Hannah said, well, pray and ask the Lord what he wants you to give. And so you could see her. She closed her eyes. Hannah was watching her in the mirror. You know, she closed her eyes. She did like this, and then she said, What? And then she said, little baby? No, not little baby. Oh, Betty baby. Oh, yeah, you can have Betty baby. I don't like her. <laughs> okay, that's cute. That's kids learning about giving. But at some point, you got to grow up. At some point, you say, Lord, what do you want me to give? And you say, that's great. That's what I'll do. That's what I'll do. So we want to develop a generous heart. Here's number four. Develop a grateful heart. Develop a grateful heart. Back in Deuteronomy 15, look at verse 15. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God redeemed you. And then he says this. Therefore, I command you this thing today. You know what he's saying? I command you to be generous. I'm commanding you. And you know on the authority that I'm commanding you is that everything you have came from me. You need to remind yourself every now and then that you were slaves. You know, every now and then I get a reminder. I leaned over to John and to David right before I came up and told them because it happened to me yesterday. It was hard going to sleep last night. I knew the enemy was trying to attack me too because this series was beginning. But Debbie got an email from a friend of ours we went to high school with, and she said, you know, love the first conference, watched on the Internet, all this, but hate to bring bad news, but we've lost two more of our class members. She named two guys, both guys I did drugs with. One of the guys I started on drugs and she, one of the guys died from a drug overdose, and the other guy committed suicide. I'm lying there last night thinking, thank you, God, for redeeming me from that type of a lifestyle. These guys now, 35 years since high school, and still, what a horrible life they must have had for 35 years. Thank you, God. You know, the Lord just reminds me. It's not hard for me to give. You understand? I didn't have anything. I was a slave. You, you didn't have anything either. No matter what you had, you didn't have anything if you didn't have Christ. A while back, a pastor and his wife were, uh, had heard me share our testimony on giving. And in this series, I'll share 
our testimony and giving. And by God's grace, Debbie and I have been able to give like many cars to people. We were able to give our first home away. Uh, we've just been able to give very extravagantly, and we love to do that. And I shared that testimony in the church, and we went to dinner with this pastor and his wife, and the wife said to Debbie, I have a question for you. And, and both of us knew the question because we've heard it many times. She said, how did you feel when your husband said he wanted to give away your house? And Debbie said, I felt great. She said, you have to remember that Robert and I were married before he got saved. And every time he's wanted to give something extravagantly, I think, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for my new husband. And then the pastor asked her a question she'd never been asked. He said, why do you think that Robert is so generous? And I'm, I'm not trying to set myself up as an example. I know many, many people are very generous. But he said, why do you think that, I mean, he just has given so extravagantly ret retirement, savings, all these things over the years. Why do you think he's so generous? And a tear came down her cheek and she said, because he's never gotten over getting saved. Malachi chapter 3, last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3. And then 2 Chronicles 31, we'll go over there in a moment. And we're going to go through a lot of scripture in this message. Uh, and I want to show you that tithing is scriptural. And it is in God's word. So Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. This is where we'll start. Malachi 3, 6. For I am the Lord, I do not change. That's very important. I don't change. I do not change. Therefore... You are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Now, I think that's humorous. He says, I don't change. That's why I haven't killed you yet, uh, personally. That's what I think he's saying there. I was nice, and I'm still nice, all right? Verse 7. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances. Now, we're going to come back to that word ordinance. What does it mean? And have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said... In what way shall we return? Now, before we read verse 8, let me just remind you, this is God talking. This is God, the God who does not change. This is the God who does not change talking. He said, you, you, you go away from my ordinances. I, I just need to probably tell you, the word ordinance means a principle of ordinary behavior. You've gone away from my principles of ordinary behavior for, for God's children. And they say, well, in what way? Now, I want you to notice this because this next verse, a preacher didn't make this up. Okay, this is God speaking. Verse 8, will a man rob God or steal from God? Yet you have robbed me. You've stolen from me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? Now, watch again. This is God talking in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that would be the church, that there may be food in my house. Again, that's the church. And try, the, the old King James uses the word prove, uh, the English Standard Version uses the word test. Test me now in this, says says. The Lord of hosts. I just want you to notice how many times he puts says the Lord of hosts so we remember who's talking here. The one who can't change is talking. Test me, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, it, it, he's, this is God talking, and this is the God who can't change. You have to remember that. And he says, you've gone away from my ordinances. You've gone away from my ordinary principles of behavior. 
Uh, tithing is an ordinary principle of behavior for God's children to thank God for their income, for their harvest, for their increase. That's an ordinary principle. And he said, because you've gone away from my ordinary principles, you're under a curse now. And you need to understand, so many times we say, well, Christians can't be under a curse because Christ bore the curse of the law on the cross. He did. That is in regards to our salvation. But are you saying then that you can live any way you want and, and it doesn't affect you? Is that what you're saying? Because that's, that's just crazy to think that way. See, see uh, the, if, we, if we steal, there are consequences. A curse is a consequence. If you steal, there's a consequence. What if you steal from God? And, and so many people say, well, yeah, but the, the, the Lord owns it all. Yes, but he actually gives us stewardship over it, but he reserves 10% for himself. That's why he says you've stolen, because he says, I have set apart the tithe for the house of God. So if you keep it, you're stealing it. And this word is also used in Joshua 6 and 7, when they took the tithe, they were supposed to bring, he said, Israel has stolen, stolen. And again, please, please hear me. I, I didn't make these words up. Th these are strong words. God says, you've stolen from me. You've robbed me. And because of that, you're under a curse. And I don't want you under a curse. I don't want you living under a curse, but you're voluntarily placing yourself under a curse because you're going away from my ordinary principles of behavior. And so I had a conversation with the Lord one time, and I said, Lord, uh, uh, the number one reason that I hear that people don't tithe is they say, well, that's in the Old Testament. That's in the Old Testament. And so I said to the Lord, um, you know, Lord, you put this in Malachi 3, and then there's Malachi 4, and then Matthew 1. Couldn't you have just waited I mean, just a little while. I mean, the, you know, these verses only miss the New Testament by like 15 verses. I mean, couldn't you just waited just a little while and put it, you know what the Lord said? To, I just felt in my spirit, he said, I put it right where I wanted it. And the reason is, here's point number one, because tithing is a test. Tithing is a test. See, God is testing our hearts. Even when a person argues about tithing, I think to myself, what is the spirit behind this? Why would this person argue when God gave his son for you and you won't even give him 10%? Why would you argue about this? It's amazing to me. I'm telling you, it's a test of your heart. It's a test. Now, uh, I, here's why I believe uh, he chose 10%. By the way, the word tithe uh, is a Hebrew word. Uh, Ma'ashra is the Hebrew word, and it means tenth part or ten percent. Tenth part, tenth. Okay, so that's where we, we get this from that we know it's ten percent. Okay, here's why I think he chose ten percent. First of all, I think he chose a percentage because it's fair to everyone. It doesn't matter if you make thirty thousand or three hundred thousand; it's a penny on every dime. It's the same for every person. Uh, but here's the reason I think he chose ten. Because for some reason, many times when you see the number 10 in the Bible, it represents testing. You'll actually see the word test with it. Uh, for instance, let me, let's, let's take a little test, all right? I'm going to ask, ask you a question, and I want you to answer me uh, out loud. Uh, all the campuses, all the churches, just say your answer out loud, all right? Here's the first question. How many plagues were there in Egypt? 10, right? Now, I could have said it a different way. I could have said, how many times did God test Pharaoh's heart? Because that's what he did. But we're familiar with how many plagues there were. All right? Here's the second question. How many commandments are there? 10. Ten okay? Um, now, I'm going to ask another question, and you might not know this, but there's a, a pattern <laughs> here. Okay? And this is in Numbers 14 where God actually says this. You can read it later, all right? But, and then I want you to say your answer just a little louder, okay? Uh, how many times did God test Israel in the wilderness? Yeah. That's correct. All right. How many times, again, you might not know this, but okay. How many times were Jacob's wages changed? Yeah. Ten. God was testing his heart. How many days was Daniel tested? Yeah. How many virgins were tested in Matthew 25? Yeah. How many days of testing are mentioned in Revelation? Yeah. How many disciples were there? No, there were 12. I was just testing you. I was just, just, I was just testing you. Okay. So tithing is a test. And, but here's something that you might not know. It's a two-way test. 
God not only tests you, but this is the only place in Scripture that I've found where God says, you can test me. Test me. This word try, that is sometimes translated test or prove, uh, it comes from uh, the way you test a metal, the way you test gold to see if it's pure. You know what God is saying? Test me to see if I'm pure. I want you to. I want you to see because I want to open the windows of heaven. I want to bless you. I want to rebuke the devourer for you. But it depends on whether you're going to thank me and worship me and walk in faith and whether you're going to believe that 90% with God's blessing will go farther than 100% without. And you open an area of faith when we do this. All right, here's number two. Number one, tithing is a test. Here's number two. Tithing is biblical. Biblical. You need to know that it's biblical. There are a lot of people that, that don't tithe, and, and here's really, you're, you're not a bad person if you don't tithe. You're not a bad person. Uh, I'm not saying that at all. Not at all. You're not a rebellious person. But a lot of people don't really believe it's in the Bible. They don't really believe it's for us today. So let me show you some scriptures, all right? We'll get to 2 Chronicles 31 in a moment. Genesis 14, verses 18 through 20. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, Salem means peace, brought out bread and wine. There's a representation of, of communion, even in the Old Testament. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him, now that's talking about Abram, Abraham, Abram, and said, blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Now watch this. And he, that's Abram, Abraham, gave him, that's Melchizedek, a tithe of all. You, you need to know, if you don't know this theologically, this is about 500 years before the law. And Galatians says Abraham's our spiritual father. And Melchizedek, Hebrew says, is a type of Christ, and many theologians believe it's actually Jesus Christ because it says he has no gene genealogy. That's what Hebrew says, no mother, no father, no, no beginning of days, no end of life. It's pretty amazing. So he, it's either Jesus himself or a type of Christ. And our spiritual father tithes, gives 10%, 500 years before the law. Look, look at Genesis 28, verse 22. This is talking about Jacob. And this stone which I've set up as a pillar shall be God's house. Again, an implication that the tithe goes to God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth. To you. This is about 400 years before the law. Leviticus 27, 30. And all the tithe of the land, all of it, all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. In other words, it belongs to God. It is holy to the Lord. Remember the word holy means set apart. God has set it apart for him. That's the only reason he could say, you're stealing from me. Because I set that apart for my house, and if you keep it, then you're stealing it. Uh, Deuteronomy 26, verses 1 and 2. And it shall be when you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, and you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take some of the first, I'll show you next week in just a moment, and later down in this passage, how that refers to the tithe, first of all the produce of the ground, which you shall bring from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you put it in a basket, now watch this, and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. Again, referring to church, where you go to, you go to church. You go to a place where the Lord chooses to make his name abide. Then look at verse 13. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the holy tithe. In other words, the set apart 10%. The holy tithe from my house and have given them to the Levite, the stranger, the fathers, and the widow. He, he directed where the tithe was to go. According to all your commandments which you have commanded me, I have not transgressed your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. I have not eaten any of it when in mourning. I didn't use some of the tithe when I went through a difficult time. Nor have I removed any of it for any unclean use, nor given any of it for the dead. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord my God and have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people. I've removed the holy set apart tenth part from, from my house and I've given it, brought it to your house, Lord. And now, he says, you, you, after you do that, you can pray this prayer. Look down from heaven and bless your servant. Okay, let me ask you a question, all right? If Jesus said it, that you ought to tithe, would you do it? 
You want to see the verse? Matthew 23, 23, Jesus is speaking. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe, 10%, of mint, anise, and cumin. Those are spices. And have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. Watch very carefully. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Okay, here's what Jesus said. You guys give tithes, not only of your first fruits, but you even give tithes of the spices that you're going to put on your food. But you've neglected justice, mercy, and faith. Then Jesus says, you ought to do that. You ought to do that. But don't leave the other undone. That's Jesus. You tithe, but you don't do this. You ought to do that. But don't leave this undone. Or you ought to do those things, but don't leave that undone. Either way. Okay, Hebrews talks about, again, Melchizedek and Jesus and how mortal men receive tithes on this earth. But let me show you what Hebrews says. Talking about Jesus is our Melchizedek. Watch this, Hebrews 7, verse 8. Here, mortal men receives, receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Listen, you put your tithe in a plate or offering bag or basket, however it is that you give your tithe, mortal men, Take care of it, manage it, things like that. But listen, in heaven, he receives it, of whom it is witnessed, he lives. Jesus Christ receives my tithes. That makes me want to tithe. So, uh, it is biblical, and here's number three. Tithing is a blessing. Tithing is a blessing. Okay, so let me tell you about uh, 2 Chronicles 31 now. We're going to read there. So if you put a marker there, 2 Chronicles 31... Hezekiah one day is reading the scriptures and he sees these verses about tithing and they're in an economic recession and he realizes we're under a curse, the whole nation, because we're not tithing, we're, we're stealing from God. So that's where we pick up the story, 2 Chronicles 31 verse 4. Moreover, he commanded the people who dwelt in Jerusalem to contribute support for the priests and the Levites that they might devote themselves to the law of the Lord. Now, just, one, just, just stop for just a moment. Um, remember, Malachi said, bring the tithe in the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And again, they were talking about natural food. But think about it today, spiritual food. Right, let me just ask you something, all right? Do, when, you, when you come to church, do you enjoy the food, the spiritual food that you get? Do you enjoy it? Okay, someone's paying for it. Let me, so let me ask you a question. Let me just put it in a, talking about food here. Let me give you an analogy. Would any of you here go to a restaurant, eat a meal, and then leave without paying for it? Any of you? <laughs> Some Christians do that every week. They go to church, eat a meal, and skip out on the check. Here's, here's the sad thing. You're the one that's hurting. I, I don't preach on tithing because the church needs money. We're, we're, we're doing fine financially. I promise you, I'm doing this to help you. This will change your life, your family, your finances, your marriage, your children, your grandchildren. This will change you. I promise you. All right, so he puts out, he says, everyone needs to bring the tithe to the house of God. Now, look at verse 5. As soon as the commandment was circulated, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits. Again, I'll show you next week how that relates to the tithe. Of grain and wine, oil and honey, and of all the produce of the field, and they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. There it is right there showing you it's the tithe. And the children of Israel and Judah who dwelt in the cities of Judah brought the tithe of oxen and sheep, 
Also the tithe of holy things which were consecrated to the Lord their God, they laid in heaps. In the third month, they begin laying them in heaps, and they finish in the seventh month. Now, these months relate to the harvest, okay? And when Hezekiah and the leaders came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people Israel. Then Hezekiah questioned the priests and the Levites concerning the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest from the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, again, the tithe always comes to, goes to the house of God, we had had enough to eat and have plenty left for the Lord has blessed his people. And what is left is this great abundance. Okay, here's what happens. Uh, the, the king sends out the, this uh, commandment and says, we're, we're supposed to be tithing to the house of God. So the people begin doing it. They begin in the third month, which is a harvest time. But then there's another harvest, the seventh month. And they continue through that time. And, and so when the king comes to visit and he sees these heaps, heaps that the people brought to the house of God, here, here's what in essence he says. It says he questioned them about the heaps. Here's what he's saying. Are the people okay? Are they okay? I mean, look, look how much they've given. Or do they have enough left? And the priest said, oh, king, as soon as the people started to do it God's way, God so blessed them what you're seeing here is just the 10%. If you think there are heaps here, go look at the 90%. Go look at how God blessed his people when they begin obeying his word. Uh, I've been in ministry now for over 30 years. I've heard two testimonies for that time about tithing, consistent testimonies. You know, Scripture says in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Okay, here are the two testimonies people have said to me. Tithers consistently have said to me, we are so blessed. Boy, it all changed when we began tithing. We are so blessed, Pastor Robert. We are so blessed. That's what tithers have said. Here's what non-tithers have said. I can't afford to tithe. That's their testimony. I can't afford to tithe. And, and again, not me, not rebellious people, just I can't afford to tithe. Listen to me. You will never be able to afford to tithe until you tithe. Because tithing is what breaks the curse and rebukes the devourer. As soon as you start to get ahead, something else will break. Because the devourer. But tithing is what rebukes him. Think about this. Jesus said, I'm going away for a while. Is that right? I'm going away. But I'm coming back. But while I'm gone, I want you to take care of my wife. 10%. You can keep the 90. Um, let me just, just to remind you, is the church the bride of Christ? Yes. Okay, listen to me very carefully. Tithing might be more personal to Jesus than what you thought. Because it's his wife. He has the power, and if you say, well, I can't believe you just take it away and give it to the others. If you don't think Jesus would do that, read the parable of the talents. When he took from the one that wasn't faithful and gave it to the one who was faithful. He wants to provide for you. But why would he provide and bless people who will not even be concerned about his wife? It's a test, and it's very important we pass this test. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. <clears throat> turn the lights back up. If we can turn the lights back up. Powerful, powerful, powerful teaching. We cannot separate. We've been on a journey, and we're on a journey to return. We started off the very first week of this new year asking God to do surgery on our hearts. Asking God to search the heart and do surgery on our heart. We cannot separate the two. And this is teaching that we need. You say, well, Pastor, surely everybody at the POM has got this down pat. That is not a true statement. And for those of us that are newer, I want you to learn and learn the right way and not assume 
that you understand how the principles of God work. I was in my mid-40s before I finally got it figured out and understood that it's not just about giving, but it's about stewarding. It's about being wise, and it's about obeying the principles of God and watching God add back over time, but there's also a stewarding. We can't drop 10% and then just go blow the other 90 and just do whatever and live any old way because God is expecting us to steward because it's all his. Now, let me just say this because I have a lot that I want to say. I won't right now. But let me just say this. This is number one for your benefit. I couldn't say, say it any better than he said. It's not because we need anything. If we needed something, I'd tell you, oh, hey, we need this. But, but I will say this. That is so powerful to me. I mentioned this within the last week and a half, two weeks, about Israel going into Babylonian captivity because he talked about the year of release, which was every seventh year, everything was released, and they were not to sow the land, they were not to reap the land, and Israel just kept on working, just kept on working, just kept, they never obeyed the principle of the seventh year, you don't sow, you don't reap, all debt is canceled. And what they did was they just put their heads down and they were too busy and they just kept on working and the harvests were too plentiful and they had work to do. And they skipped that seven-year time of release and rest for 70 years. 400, excuse me, 490 years. They missed it 70 times. And then when they went into Babylonian captivity, they went for 70 years because it was one year for every seventh year that they just put their head down and barreled through. And this is the point that I want to make. God will never just blink and close his eyes and say, ah, it's been 490 years. It's too late now. We can't get that back. He sent them into captivity for 70 years, his mercy waiting for them to apply the principles of God. Can I tell you that God is going to get his 10%? He's going to get it. He may not get it from you this paycheck. He may not get it from you this year. But God, we will never beat God out of the tent. It's his, and he's going to come and get it back. Whether it's a car that breaks down, a washing machine that breaks down, a hospital bill, uh, God's going to get it. He is going to, it may take him 50 years, but you can better believe that God is going to get it. So we can either obey the principles and, and what live in the blessings or feel like we cannot do it or refuse. I, I, don't, I don't agree with him in saying that you're not rebellious because if any time you willingly defy the word of God, there, there, there's a, a sense of rebellion there. It's the one thing I don't agree with in his, in his statement. He's trying to be very kind. But the bottom line is if we knowingly understand the word of God and we just refuse to do it, it's not rebellious toward anyone but God and his word. But God will get his, or we can do it God's way, which is always the best way. And I want to see the people that I love apply the principles to live the blessed life. But here's the thing. We also have to make sure that we're being wise with the other 90%. And we'll get into this subject matter of it's in the giving of the offerings. He said, you rob me in tithe and offerings. It's in our offerings that the multiplication of the harvest actually comes back into our lives. But God is going to get his some way, somehow. God is going to get the tenth. He's going to get it. But if we'll just do it God's way, there's no greater way. I'm telling you, there's no greater way. And for those of you that have never dreamed imaginable or ever knew what it was like to live in a realm of financial freedom, there is nothing like it in this world. And to, again, our young people, our youth, our hyphen, you're working, you've got jobs. It doesn't matter because it's the percentage that you give, and it's all equal in God's eyes. But it's indicative of the heart. And we can't be on a journey of returning 
without talking about the fact that we need to make some returns, some of us, and pass the test when it comes to how we're stewarding the blessings of God in our lives. Amen. Let's stand tonight in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God tonight. We thank you for your teaching. We thank you for the time together. We thank you for these principles, the reminder, the introduction. And Lord, we pray that God, wherever the seed fall, that it would be fruitful. Bless your people tonight. Get us home safely. Bring us back on Sunday for an amazing day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless. We love you. Have a good night.